Frequently asked questions. Frequently asked questions by personal injury. Someone somewhere. Medical malpractice. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk about criminal. Yeah. Personal injury, criminal. And where do you find You're going to answer. Google? Are these frequently asked questions from Google? They're from somewhere. somewhere. Someone, somewhere. Someone somewhere. wants to know. So we're going to answer them for them. Sounds good. All right. All right. Medical malpractice, I feel like, is such a generalized statement. And mm -hmm. it can mean so many different things. So let's talk. Let's, let's see. Can you file medical malpractice against someone besides a doctor? So you can... You can file a medical malpractice claim against anyone who's a healthcare provider. Okay. So obviously, it's usually a doctor, mm -hmm. but it can be um, an anesthesiologist, um, a physician's assistant, um, a pharmacy, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be a doctor, but of course it usually is. And I'm assuming that you would also sue the hospital or whatever facility. Yes, that yes, that's correct. Person right. is under. So okay. you can sue the doctor individually and you sue the hospital um, that they're working for as well. Okay. So what is the statute of limitations for medical malpractice? So in New York, the statute of limitations is two and a half years. Mm -hmm. That is about six months shorter than a normal negligence claim. Okay. So... It's interesting because some people, like when is the start of a case typically? Because what if you're ill and then you don't realize something was messed up until, you know, two years right. later? That's a good question. So the statute of limitations starts when you, um, when you first find the injury. Okay. Right. So let's just take a simple example. Mm -hmm. Let's say that Please. They, did, uh, <laughs> they did a surgery and they left. I don't know, a towel in your stomach, Okay. right? So the statute of limitations would be two and a half years from when you found the, um, the, towel. the object, yes, okay. yeah, right, the towel, yeah. Okay, all right, so that's good. That kind of gives you a little bit more time. It does, yeah, yeah, two and a half years. Okay, and then, oh, this is a good one. So can nursing home cases be considered medical malpractice? So yes, so obviously part of being in a nursing home is medical services. Mm -hmm. So as yeah. long as it relates to the healthcare providers, then yes, it could be. Okay. Um, but obviously, nursing home cases can also involve regular negligence, right? So slip and falls, negligent supervision. Um, Which things, would be like personal injury. Would be like normal personal okay. injury, right? Exactly. Normal negligence, three-year statute of limitations. But, okay. you know, if you have situations where someone's being provided the wrong medications, mm -hmm. right? That would be more in the realm of a medical malpractice. Suit. Gotcha. Hmm. All right, well, let's move on to personal injury questions. All right. Um, all right, so what is a personal injury? Let's just start there. So a personal injury is a physical or psychological injury that's caused by another person typically by their negligence or intentional acts. Okay, and caused by another person can mean, let's let's go even simpler, like <laughs> a car. You're driving a car, yep. right? You're driving a car and someone reds a, runs a red light mm -hmm. and they hit you and you're hurt, right? Okay. That's personal injury. Mm -hmm. That other person was negligent by running the red light and then you have physical injuries as a result. Yeah. Um, Another example would be like a dog. You own a dog and it bites someone. You own a dog and it bites somebody, right? Yeah. Um, so dog bites are obviously a little different in New York. So they're not really about negligence. Those are what's called strict liability. Mm -hmm. um, so you could hold the dog owner responsible for the bite um, without showing any negligence as long as um, they knew or should have known about prior dangerous propensities of the dog. Okay. Um, and so that's a little different. Um, and in terms of intentional, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of these cases, you know, personal injury lawsuits, right? Besides just personal injury can be intentional or um, negligence. Okay. But I think it's just important to note that most insurance policies are typically going to cover um, negligent acts and don't cover intentional acts. Okay. So some of the most. That's interesting. Why right. do you think that is? Well, I think that um, putting on the spot. <laughs> What's your personal opinion? My personal opinion as to why. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I, I guess, you know, maybe it would lead to more fraud, I suppose, mm-hmm. right? Um, if I'm like, hey, hit me with your car. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, think yeah. about a homeowner's policy, right? Yeah. Um, right. Like, well, that makes sense because people set intentional fires, right? Right, exactly. For, like, I don't know, let's I mean, give an example of like a restaurant that's not doing well. Like, they set it on that's fire and they get example. the insurance money. Right, like exactly. That. So they don't cover that because you intentionally set it on fire, right. right? But if it's an accident, like, that's what you're insuring for. Right. Like that's why you get insurance is to cover accidents. Okay. You don't get insurance in case you decide that you want to burn your house down, yeah. right? Commit arson. Yeah. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so what are the most common kinds of personal injury cases? So I would say um, car accidents and slip and falls mm-hmm. um, are the most common. Um, so, and again, these are things that insurance covers, mm-hmm. right? So um, you're going after insurance policies, um, homeowners insurance, right? Apartment complexes have insurance policies. Mm-hmm. Obviously we're all schools, yeah. right? We're all required to have auto policies. Right, that's where a firm like us steps in. Do you, so let's say you like fell in a pothole or something and mm-hmm. it's covered. So does the city or town that that happens in, like it's a publicly owned area, yes. is they're covered under insurance? How yep, that there's work? insurance policies for that. Okay. So you put in what's called a notice of claim against the government agency. Mm-hmm. And then um, in New York, you only have a certain amount of days to do that, right? Yep, uh, 90 days okay. to file a notice of claim. Um, and then they could have the right to have a hearing, what's called a 50 each hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like a deposition, but they get to do it essentially pre-suit because at that point you haven't filed a lawsuit yet. Okay. You file your notice of claim, the city has a right to do a hearing, mm-hmm. and then after that you can either resolve the claim or file a lawsuit and proceed as a normal negligence action. But yes, yeah, so you would sue whatever government agency would be responsible for okay. filling in the pothole. Um, so um, I would say cases like that are the most common are the most common and they're typically the kind of cases that firms like ours would handle mm-hmm. um, you know insurance covers them the policies for this stuff and um, it often takes uh, it takes a lot to um, to get them to pay you know yeah well speaking of let, and this is going off the <laughs> sure. frequently asked question yes but I think some people don't understand I mean obviously, we live this every day Mm -hmm. so we understand a little bit more of what's going on in the process but a lot of people who go through something like this and get hurt or injured somewhere they don't understand what the policy maximum is and um like why like someone gets hurt and they think they're going to get millions of dollars which isn't always the case yeah i mean there are limitations really for two reasons. So Mm -hmm. one is the type of injury that you have, and then two is how much the insurance covers, what the policy is. Mm -hmm. So for example, there are a lot of people who have $25,000 car policies, and that's it. And maybe you were hit by Bill Gates and he has, you know, five cars and all these personal assets you can go over, but obviously that's highly, highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. That person doesn't have any personal assets that you can go after. Right. And you have that $25,000 policy and that's it. So you might have a really bad injury. Um, but you can't get more than that because there isn't any. Because there isn't any. Right? So how can you protect yourself against something like that? So you can get what's called some coverage, mm-hmm. underinsured coverage on your own auto policy. Okay. So you can pay for extra coverage in case the person that hits you doesn't have enough. How important do you think that is? I think consider? it's extremely important. I mean... There are a lot of cases we get with $25,000 policies, right? And you could have injuries, broken arms and legs, and people who need multiple surgeries, and those could be injuries that are worth over $100,000. But if they have a twenty-five, and you either have a small sum coverage or none at all. um, Yeah, your SOL. Yeah, that might be be the extent of what you can get. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, all right. So the last question for personal injury is what is the difference between <laughs> compensatory and yeah. punitive damages? There you go. I'll finish that for you. Thank you. Um, what is your damage, Heather? So compensatory damages are um, for your pain and suffering, mm-hmm. for your economic damages, um, for medical expenses. So that's to essentially, the idea is essentially to 
compensate you for your loss. Okay. Right? To make you whole. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, punitive damages, that's to punish. Okay. So that's... Like, that would be a like a negligent act or something. Yeah, it but, would have to be, you know, like so with criminal. It would have to be charges attached. Like, what do you mean? Not necessarily criminal. I think a great example is um, that everybody knows is the McDonald's case. Okay. Remember the coffee? Yes. The yeah, they got like thirty the really million coffee. or something. Yeah, a judge actually eventually cut that part down. Oh, but really? <laughs> that amount comes from the punitive damages. Okay. Um, because it's meant to deter the person from doing it again. Um, okay. And a lot of times these are done against companies. Okay. Um, so like oil spills and stuff like that. Right. Um, but their idea was, you know, McDonald's needs to be punished they need mm -hmm. to, and be forced to change their behavior. Okay. Right. So in that case, it was making your coffee not as hot. Yes. Um, and paying but, $30 million. <laughs> right. So, yes, exactly. So okay. it's meant as a deterrent. It's okay. meant as a, as a punishment. Gotcha. As opposed to just making this person whole. So I would, if I had to guess, that's probably not always the case. Like, that's probably not very common. No, it's not common. And again, it's typically in cases involving um, big businesses. Okay. So okay. your typical uh, running a stop sign. Yeah. Is, uh, is not going to have punitive damages okay. involved. Wow. Um, but if you have, um, I'm just trying to think of an example off the top of my head. If you have a trucking company, mm -hmm. right, like a big tractor trailer company who's, I don't know, I'm going to make up a stupid example. Mm -hmm. They're hiring truckers that don't have CDLs. Okay. Right? And you're like, this is horrible. Like, you need to be, you know, this is, you and need then to be punished for this to change your policy. Yeah. Right. Right. Like you need to, you need to understand, you know, more than just the cost of that one case. Okay. You need to be punished to deter you from that behavior. Gotcha. All right. Well, we'll transition right into auto and traffic accidents. Perfect. Then. Look at that. All right. If you have been involved in an auto accident, should I go to the doctor? I feel like we get asked this <laughs> question all yes. the time. And I think the answer is if something is bothering you, yes. Yeah. You should go right you, away. you, as an attorney, can't tell someone to go to the doctor, right? Like, typically? Like, that's not... No, I don't tell... No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, we don't give medical advice. Right. Um, but I think it's very important to have your symptoms documented. Mm -hmm. So, because... And injuries take time to develop sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, you might just be sore and you're thinking, oh, it's nothing. Until you it know, doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. And, you know, two months later, you're at the doctor and they're telling you you've broken rib. Mm -hmm. But now you're giving the insurance company ammunition to say, well, how do we know it's related to this accident? You right. went six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks after. Yeah, you could have fallen somewhere or right. something in between exactly. happened. Exactly. So I think okay. it's very important if you feel symptoms to go as soon as possible to make sure that it's documented as being related to the accident. Right. Well, plus you would think it's your health. Like, yeah, and, you yeah. want to just make sure you're good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On the not law side of it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Just take care of yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That is free advice yes. right there. Um, not medical advice. We're not providing No, not advice. medical advice. Just life mm -hmm. advice. <laughs> um, so what information should I document following an accident? Uh, so this is a good question. Um, I think that right after it happens at the scene, taking photographs of the damage of your vehicle, the damage of the other person's, um, you know, make a note of anything that the other driver says. Okay. Any witnesses. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is a big one. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. You know, it was my fault. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't have ran that red light. <laughs> yeah. Um, something they say, make a note of it. Yeah. Um, if another witness comes up and says, hey, I saw the whole thing, get that person's name and number, mm -hmm. you know, as long as they're willing to give it to you. Right. Um, so I think that's good stuff to do at the scene. Mm -hmm. Another thing is the accident exchange form. When you call okay. the police and they respond, they have a form which has your information and the other driver's information mm -hmm. and their insurance information. Okay. Um, and this way you have access to their policy. Um, and that's what you, so I don't know if, 
if you've never been in an accident, you don't get the police report necessarily the next day. Right, It takes exactly. time. So the exchange form is something that you need and you get immediately so that yes. you can start right. communicating with an attorney or an insurance company yep. or you whatever. You start communicating with an attorney, insurance company. You have the actual um, record number mm -hmm. for the police report, so then you can then obtain Find a it. copy of it yeah. or your attorney can get a copy of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something else that's important to do at the scene. Okay. And then afterwards, um, obviously documenting um, medical appointments, mm -hmm. um, any lost wages, um, any, any information you get from the insurance company along the way, make sure you keep a record yeah. of that stuff. And photos, I don't know, did you say it before? I probably did, but photos of the injury, like as you progress and heal, yep. that's always that's important. A, that's great too. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you, you know, your leg's swollen or whatever mm -hmm. um, after, make sure you take pictures. Yeah. Um, all right, and if the accident is my fault, should <laughs> I say so? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's important to be honest about what happened. Yes. Um, I feel like that's such a hard question. Because it's a very hard question. I think you don't want to incriminate say, yourself, but you also should do the right thing, right? Like that's. Yeah, absolutely. I that's think that's my opinion. <laughs> you know, I think what I'll say is fault. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful with the word fault. Okay. Because that's a conclusion. Okay. You know, I think that you should be honest about what happened. Mm -hmm. But whether or not you're at fault is a conclusion. Right. Like that's your own opinion, I guess. Exactly. And yeah. I think that things might not always be what you think they are. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you could be honest about what you did, what you saw the other driver did, do mm -hmm. to the best of your recollection. Yeah. But I think assigning blame to yourself or the other person right away mm -hmm. um, probably isn't necessary. Okay. And, you know, you just you might think it's your fault, mm -hmm. but it's not. Yeah. And I think that after the accident happens, going up to the other driver and saying, "Oh my God, it was my fault. I'm sorry." Yeah. Right. It you probably just isn't. Hold that in. Yeah, probably <laughs> isn't the best yeah. course because you're making a conclusion mm -hmm. that might not necessarily be correct. Gotcha. You know, uh, you should call the police and they can come and they'll do an investigation and right. they might write tickets and you're gonna. Afterwards, if you're hurt, you might call a lawyer, and mm -hmm. after all that information comes out, you might realize, no, I wa it really wasn't my fault. Yeah. So I just think that you have to be careful with that word. Okay. Um, just be so that's con what say. conscientious of what you're saying. Yes, exactly. All right. Exactly. What else do we have? All right, we oh, have the criminal the side. Criminal side. <laughs> so, how is, all right. I'm gonna re-ask that. Okay. How is sentencing for a criminal offense decided? So, uh, sentencing, I'll start by saying that every crime has a range. Okay. So. A range of what? A range of possible sentences. Okay. So, for example, assault in the second degree, it's a de-violent felony in New York. Mm -hmm. If you're going to send it to prison time, it goes from two to seven years. Okay. That's the range in terms of prison time. Mm -hmm. But you can also get probation depending on your prior convictions or not having any. Um, okay. You can get a conditional discharge. Um, so you don't necessarily have to get prison, but there are different guidelines. And then that can change depending on if you have a prior felony, a prior violent felony. Um, okay. So if you have a prior violent felony in the last 10 years before that, mm -hmm. your sentencing range changes from five to, seven, to five to seven years. Okay. So you can't get two years anymore and you can't get probation right. if you're convicted of that charge. So it's specific to really the severity and if you have priors. So there's a, yes. there's a lot of different there's things. There's a lot that, that goes into it. So depending on the crime, are there kind of like calculations of what you're going to get so or potentially get? When you say calculations, do mm -hmm. you mean that? Like, like a by, formula, like you have this prior really, well, and it's this severe. And in a way, yes. Like these are the guidelines, like the, the max and the minimum. Yeah, the severity, like the specific facts, mm -hmm. you know, Oh, we'll talk about 
how they come to the number next. Okay. I think, so you can have in felonies A through E. Okay. And like an A violent felony, B violent, like all these different levels, Mm -hmm. if that's what you mean by severity, they have different sentencing ranges. Okay. Um, So like, for example, an assault second is a D violent felony. Okay. That's the two to seven range. Um, So, but how they actually get to the number, either a judge decides it after you're convicted. Um, If you had a jury trial and you're convicted of assault second, Mm -hmm. the judge would decide what the sentence is. Okay. Based on those same factors. Do you have a prior violent felony? You know, the fact, the specific facts of the case. Do I want to give you two years, five years, seven years? Okay. You know, do I, based on your history and what I saw at the trial, maybe I just want to give you five years of probation. Mm-hmm. So in that case, the judge decides. Okay. But you could also have plea bargaining. So that's when the district attorney and the person's defense attorney agree on a sentence. They mm-hmm. say, I'll plead guilty in exchange for this sentence. And a lot of times during plea bargaining, what you can do is you can reduce um, what the level of the crime is. Okay. And the judge still ultimately decides if that's acceptable or not, or no? Um, Depends. The judge I, the judge can reject your plea. Mm-hmm. They refuse to go along with it. Okay. I think that's rare. All right. I think, you know, the district attorney and the defense attorney and other judges, some judges might not agree with me, <laughs> but I think they're in the best position to know the facts of the case. Okay. And I think that them coming to that, that agreement, most judges are going to be okay with that. Okay. Um, and to give an example with the assault second. Yeah. Um, let's say it's an assault second and the person has no um, prior felony convictions. Okay. So the DA and the defense attorney talk and they agree will plea from an assault second down to an assault third. Now, assault third is a misdemeanor, punishable up to 364 days in jail. Okay. So let's just say they pick nine months. Mm-hmm. They say, okay, my risk on the assault second is two to seven. Um, we came to an agreement. I'll plead to an assault third with nine months. So that's how, you know, that's just an example of how you get to that number within okay. all the different ranges of outcomes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um um, in a situation where a judge is deciding mm-hmm. the sentencing, what is something that a criminal defense attorney would do to help the judge make a informed decision on sentencing? So um, one thing they can do is have a pre-sentence investigation report done. Okay. Um, so that's where they go to probation. Typically, these are done before sentencing after somebody's convicted. Okay. But you can do it before a plea as a way of giving the judge more information about the person. Okay. So if you feel like this is um, a good person with limited history, who works, who has mm-hmm. good ties to the community, et cetera, et cetera, you know, this can give them a full picture of who that person is. So that's okay. an option. Mm-hmm. Obviously, most times you have pretrial conferences mm-hmm. where the DA defense attorney meets with the judge and they can give them information about the case, about the person. They'll have a, a record printed out of their prior history. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's obviously the most common way. Um, and then are the, the sentencing memos are also one, right? Like we're So sentencing so memos are typically federal. Okay. Those are done in federal court. Okay, but um, it's kind of similar. It's just on like the the shoulders of the ad- defense attorney, right? Yeah, like kind are, of showing that this person. Those are a little different because in. I was just curious. I'm yeah, in the question. federal in the federal cases, <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of times you have um, a big sentencing range, okay. and you're pleading guilty before you know what the sentence is going to be. Okay. So you said, I'm going to plead guilty. My range, and I'm just making up numbers, Mm -hmm. is 10 to 25. Okay. Now you're going to submit a sentencing memo to them to Mm -hmm. say, I want X number. And this is why. And this is why. Okay. Right. But in a state case, you're you're not going to do sentencing memos. Gotcha. Okay. Um, That makes sense. Because you're going to, you know, obviously you want to be heard on sentencing. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you could let's take the assault second example. Mm -hmm. It's two to seven. They're convicted after a jury trial, so it's totally up to the judge. You're going to be able to be heard on sentencing. You're going to comment on the pre-sentence investigation report we just talked about. Mm -hmm. You can have people submit letters who know them to the judge asking, you know, telling them about the person. Right. The defendant has opportunity to be heard themselves. So all of that stuff ends up being similar to what is in a sentencing memo. Okay. Those just typically aren't filed in the same gotcha. in the same manner. Okay, that makes sense. All right. What are Miranda rights? So Miranda rights are your rights with respect to um, speaking to police after you've been arrested. Okay. After you've been arrested. After you've is been the arrested, key. yes, that is the key. Okay. Um, and they, the case was um, Miranda. That was the name of the Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to read the person their rights, and they have to understand their rights and voluntarily waive those rights. Okay. Um, to be order in, in order for the police to speak with you. Okay. Um, so those are the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you. Mm -hmm. You have the right to an attorney. Uh, if you can't afford an attorney, one can be provided to you. Mm -hmm. And then typically they'll say, um, if you want to stop talking, you can stop at any time. Okay. And then they're going to ask if you understand those rights and if you're willing to waive those rights and speak. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so typically on TV, what you see is they'll like put them in a handcuff somewhere and then they'll like read them as they walk out to the yes. police car. That's typically not what happens. Okay. At least not here. Because technically have they been arrested? They're being arrested. So then. they are arrested, okay. yes, but nobody's going to talk to them in that context. Okay. So let's just say a road patrol officer makes an arrest on a, mm -hmm. war on a warrant. So they put them in handcuffs, they put them in the back of the car, they take them to the um, police station. They're going to put them in an interview room that's being recorded. Okay. An investigator is going to come sit down and mm -hmm. speak with them. That's the interrogation. At that point, gotcha. the investigator will say something like, you know, my name's investigator, Whatever. blah, blah. <laughs> and, um, you know, we want to speak with you about this incident. Before yeah. I do so, I have to read your rights. They read the rights exactly as I said them. Okay. They'll ask them if they understand, if they agree to waive the rights and speak with them. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of people maybe don't understand the timeline of when they're supposed to be read and we'll have you know people call who just don't know and they're like i wasn't read my miranda rights correctly and they might not have been but they might have been they just yeah. don't know you know it's, when you're when you're supposed to have them read right and it's actually very complicated it's one of the most litigated issues in criminal law hmm. because there is a lot of nuance to it yeah um it's interesting. Yeah, it is. And, you know, for example, like, when are you under arrest, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't always simple. Yeah. Um, you know, when a defendant is being interrogated and they say, I don't want to talk to you anymore, right? And the investigator just keeps asking them questions. Right. Right. They're supposed to stop. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are time periods that elapse where they can go back into the room and See if they want to talk again. Yeah, which or is, maybe they just start voluntarily offering information. Yeah, which is um, why it's important to get an attorney. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. You know, you want to, you want somebody to look at all those issues because right. it's complicated. And every, you know, every defendant is entitled to what's called a Huntley hearing. Mm -hmm. So it's a hearing in front of a judge about the voluntariness of the plea, whether or not Miranda rights were read, if they were read, if they were properly read. Mm -hmm. um, so it's heavily litigated um, and it's complicated. Hmm. All right, and then how do I find out if there's a warrant for my arrest? I would call your local police department. <laughs> but can you call and be like, do I have an arrest warrant? Oh yeah, people do it all the time. And But then what if there is one? You what do they do? Are they like, you Where are you? We're coming. To, we're coming to get you. Like, and do they pin? Like, is that no. incriminating I mean, yourself? Well, no, that's not incriminating. Yourself. What do you? So yeah. So if you aren't sure if there's, you can call the yeah, police you can station. Call and ask. Find out. And can someone else call for you? Will they give that information? I'm sure they would. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm sure they would. Yeah. Um, you know, on on very serious cases, of course. Um, a right. lot of times they're what's called sealed warrants, so you wouldn't know, mm -hmm. you know, if they're looking for you for a murder, mm -hmm. you know, 
Yeah. Um, they, those are typically seal borings, okay. and, and you're not going to know until they come. Yeah. Busting in. Well, because I feel like a lot of cases, you know, people don't even know they have warrants and then mm -hmm. they get pulled over for like a traffic yep. violation. Yeah. And then they're like, just by the way, you have a warrant. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, yeah. what? Yeah, that and happens. Like sometimes, like it's interesting because like, I think there's been a couple times where it's like someone had a ticket from like 15 years ago and they like didn't go to court and then they live their life yeah. and no one's ever tried to find them obviously yeah. and then they get pulled over later and they're like you have a warrant and people are like what like what do you do yeah you a lot of warrants come attorney. from not <laughs> yeah, calling law yeah. um yeah a lot of people don't know you know show, not showing up to court mm -hmm. um they miss a court date the court issues a warrant yeah and then uh but and then write down your court, like, write down your court dates. Yes, <laughs> go to court. Yes, your lawyer will remind you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Driving under the influence. What if I go to jail? And oh wait, will I go to jail if I'm convicted of a DUI? All right. So first, there is no DUI in New York. Okay. So let's there just go. It. Let's so just it, go through. All yeah. the what it is. Break it down. So <laughs> in New York, it's called driving while intoxicated. Okay. DUI stands for driving under the influence. Yes. And it, that's, it's called that in some states. Wait, he, okay. So driving under the influence, I always thought was alcohol related. And DUI was always like drug related. No, did I just like make that up in my <laughs> so I'll So in New York, driving while intoxicated, mm -hmm. DWI, okay. is alcohol. Okay. There, That is a misdemeanor. I'll go through some of the other way okay. to get to a felony okay there's also a violation level mm -hmm. which is driving while ability impaired okay. by alcohol that's just the equivalent of a traffic ticket but it holds some more serious consequences okay but it's not an actual crime on your record if you're using drugs there is a misdemeanor called driving while ability impaired by drugs so okay. dwai okay. is driving on while well, ability impaired by drugs in okay. New York. That's like what you were That's thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Yes. Okay. Uh, Is that new? <laughs> no, no. It doesn't sound as good as DUI. It, yeah. Um, it sounds more complicated. It sounds more complicated. Yeah. Okay, um, but DUI is a thing in other states, just not. Yeah, they might know. call it, you know, whether it's alcohol or drugs, they might call it DUI. Gotcha. But um, I think it's important to know the differences between the different crimes in New York. Okay. Um, so we'll continue to use DWI. Yeah, we'll continue. use DWI. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to go through all the different types. Mm -hmm. So there's DWI, the common law version, which is that you're intoxicated, not able to operate a vehicle as a reasonable and prudent driver. Mm -hmm. Then there's another DWI charge for your blood alcohol content. So okay. if you take a breath test and you're a .08 or higher. Mm -hmm. Those are both misdemeanors. Okay. A lot of times they're charged together. You can't get consecutive time on them. Can or can't? You can't. Okay. But they're typically charged together. Okay. Assuming that you agreed to take the breath test. Gotcha. They can be felonies if you have a prior DWI conviction or mm -hmm. DWAI by drug con conviction in the past 10 years. Okay. Um, or if you're driving with a child. Okay, yeah. So those are how and they get to be And then you'll probably get an Ewok. You would also. also get an endangering the welfare of a child yeah. are typically charged with that as well. Okay. Um, then, like I said, the violation version is um, is if you're a .06 or less than a .06. Okay. Or typically... Um, Let's just say you pass a lot of the field sobriety tests. Mm -hmm. um, but typically that is um, almost used as a reduction in New York in plea bargaining okay. or after trial. So, but you're still under the legal limit. You're under the legal limit, but your ability to operate the vehicle is impaired to any extent. Gotcha. Okay. So it's just a lesser version of a DWI. Okay. And it's very so rarely it's, charged. Yeah, I was going to say, how Typically do you the DWI, prove that? If you took a breath test and you were a .04, mm -hmm. they could just charge you with the DWAI ticket. Gotcha. Sometimes they still don't because they like to say, oh, but we're still going to charge you with the common law 
version. Okay. So, so they get pulled. So and they do that because of the BAC and then like the field sobriety. Test yeah, that's typically something, or you know, or the sh the way you're, you're driving while yep, you're pulled over to yep, begin with. Yeah. Right. Okay. Run a stop sign. They spell alcohol. They run you through field sobriety tests. Mm -hmm. You fail them under arrest. That's interesting. They give you a breath test. Hmm. Um, okay. But the violation level, it's very rare that it would be charged. Interesting. But it is very common to get one after a trial or plea bargaining. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. So will I lose my license because of a DWI? So Maybe. if you're convicted of the misdemeanor <laughs> DWI, it's a six month license revocation. Okay. The felony version, it's a year. Mm -hmm. Also, the um, there's what's called an aggravated DWI, which is still a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm but it's a 0.18 or higher, and that's a one-year license revocation. Okay. If you're convicted of the DWAI by alcohol, that's a 90-day suspension. Okay. Um, and then let's say you have three prior DWIs. Well, you can, um, you so, the, so the court is giving you those suspensions mm -hmm. um, as part of your sentence, but the DMV, administratively do their own gotcha ha have some of their own um so punishment. the dmb so, can revoke your license yes and if the they want right and if you have that many dwis um they will i don't know off the top of my <laughs> head will. but they yeah. can actually you can lose your license for your whole life yeah yikes yeah um so do you lose your license if you do not take a breathalyzer test when you get pulled over? Yes, you'll be revoked for one year if you refuse to take the breath test. Like regardless of? Regardless of what the court does, the DMV mm -hmm. is revoking you for one year. Yikes. If you okay. do agree to take the breath test, mm -hmm. you still get your license suspended by the court, but you can get a temporary license to drive to work in school. Okay, gotcha. Um, Another thing, just to note, um, officers often have um, what's called a pre-screen. Mm -hmm. It's like a small roadside breath test mm -hmm. that they use as part of their investigation. Yeah. Um, along with the field sobriety tests. Okay. It's not the standards for calibrating it are not as strict as the main breath test. Mm -hmm. After you're placed under arrest, when they bring you back to the police station. Mm -hmm. That's like your official number, what your charges are based on. Okay. But they can use that pre-screen just to get an idea in, to, in making um, the decision about, yes, yeah. about whether or not to arrest the person. Gotcha. So if you do a pre-screen and you're a 0 0.10, right, that can be one of the reasons they use that probable cause mm -hmm. to arrest you. Now, the reason I bring that up is refusing to take that pre-screen, you can get a separate traffic ticket for it, okay. but you can't get your license revoked. Gotcha. The revoking is for the breath test that's after arrest. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, is a DWI considered a felony? You kind of already yeah. touched on that. Right, but. so it's about the priors and if you're driving with children in the car. Gotcha. You know, and of course, you know, if you kill someone we're talking about. Yeah. You know. So don't drink and drive, yes. Uber, obviously. Don't drink and drive. Get a, get a ride, so. Um, all right, and then last question. What kind of criminal cases do we handle here at King Law? Here at King Law, we handle all criminal cases. Okay. So everything from domestic cases, DWIs, petty larceny, grand larceny, mm -hmm. auto theft, burglaries, robberies, murders, drugs, guns. Pretty much anything, yeah. Pretty much anything. And. I'll just, let's, let's add in. I didn't do this with personal injury. Yeah. What kind of personal injury cases do we take at King Law? So at King Law, we handle car accidents. Mm -hmm. We handle slip and falls. Um, we'll do some um, med mal or nursing cases, mm -hmm. depending on uh, what type of cases those are. Yeah. Um, we'll handle cases against school districts, um, workplace, Pretty much accidents, any negligent. Any kind of negligence, you know, mm -hmm. construction accidents. Okay. Um, any negligence-based cases uh, we'll handle. Nice. All right. So there are your answers to your frequently asked questions. Yes. <laughs> that concludes this episode of the King Law Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and check out our socials at King Law Attorneys. 
And if you've happened to have been injured or charged with a crime, now you know who to call. King Law. Take charge. <laughs>